Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. Today we are going to talk about last year's election, but we're going to talk about it because there is a book out called The Battle for America 2008, the story of an extraordinary election. And the book is going to bring it all back to you with an immediacy and a comprehension that you didn't know existed. And the reason for that is that two veteran journalists have undertaken to do this for us, Dan Balls and Haynes Johnson. Uh, Haynes Johnson, you're probably more familiar with. He was a a Sunday talking head for a long, long time, as well as a great member of the Washington Post uh, staff of of writers. And right now he has uh, a job as chair of uh, the night. He has the night chair in journalism at the University of Maryland. Dan Balls continues to work for the Washington Post as a political reporter, and uh, we're very pleased to have two great journalists with us. Thanks for coming by. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Glad you know, here. Th- this is uh, uh, the story that, that, that you tell is a story, uh, as you say in the book, one of the most important elections in the history of the country. Now, one of the things that I want to say, and I haven't heard anybody say it before, is that you two guys wrote this. And it is seamless. If, if, if you didn't have two names on here and I read this book, I, I would say one guy wrote it. And I think that's a fantastic achievement. That's what we would like to have people say because when you write a book collaboratively, it has to have one voice. And what we did is go back and forth with the chapters that we drafted, that we have talked about, that we blocked out to do, and shared it back and forth, and finally said, okay, this is the final version. Yeah. And then uh, agreed upon it both, and then sent it up to New York. And Dan, you're still talking to one another? Barely. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a great Just collaboration, Jim. It was, uh, it was a delight. Haynes has written a lot of books. I have not, um, but this worked wonderfully. We divided up the reporting we split up the writing, and as Haynes said, there was a meeting of the minds in the language that was used and the way we set chapters up and the narrative. Yeah. We had terrific editing, I should add. Uh, we had Jim Silberman and also Wendy Wolf, and uh, this book is immeasurably better for that. But uh, the, the goal was, as you say, to, to make it a seamless narrative uh, and also to tell a story that people think they know and in many ways do know but to keep it suspenseful and to provide some new information. And there's a lot of new information in this book. Yeah, that's that's the whole feeling when you when you read, oh, I know that. And then the next thing you start, oh, hell, I never heard of that. Oh, did I ever hear of that? <laughs> that was what was so wonderful about doing this book, Jim, is that uh, we learned ourselves. We, we thought we knew a lot. We watched things. We saw what other people were reporting, traveling. But the more we got into it, the more astonished we were at the things we were learning. We didn't really understand Obama's frustrations, for instance. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. the picture you saw in the public. Uh-huh. Uh, the the invincible Clinton machine was, you know, couldn't invincible. be beaten. <laughs> right, and and so all that until it wasn't. Until yeah. it wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> Trojan so, horse. Time. So you go through this and McCain's ups and downs, and then yeah. the picking of Sarah Palin. All, all of this was incredible, and it kept it kept us enthralled. We did a lot of interviews along the way, uh, which were done only for the book and uh, embargoed until the book came out was the understanding with these folks. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to provide as contemporaneous an account of what was happening as possible. You know, after the fact, there's a lot of stuff you can unearth, but one thing you can't unearth is what people were actually thinking about at that moment because memories change or they fade or revisionism sets in. So it was important to us to be able to kind of build a foundation of information as we went through the election uh, and then to go back after the election and unearth additional material. So that's why the book, we think, provides both freshness and new information. And it requires trust on the part of people you're talking to. You will not violate your promise. Mm -hmm. You're not going to write anything until it's all over. Right. And that's, that's very, very important. If they trust you, then they'll talk to you more. At the same time, you have them... They've talked to you way back then. They can't take it back. You've, you've got them on the record for the book. And so it, it, it really is a good system. It works for, at least it worked for us. Worked well. I, I'm sorry. I have one more curious question that I, that I have to ask. Uh, somewhere in the book, or maybe more than once, you say, and then we were on the campaign trail. And that gives me this question. Uh, 
Did you were you on the campaign trail all the time? Did you fly in in the plane and or the buses or whatever? Well, we used the royal we in the sense that if if one of us was at right. a place, we say we in the book rather than that Dan was there or Haynes yeah. was there. Yeah. Um, but yes, we were uh, we were out a lot. I in particular because of what I was doing at the Washington Post, ah. just covering the campaign. So. Um, so you were I you, was, you, you were filing at the same time. Absolutely, were, yeah. no, no. I was doing yeah. almost yeah. almost literally every day a piece for the Washington Post, and that really it really meant that Dan was the lead reporter for the Washington Post politically. He is the lead reporter, mm-hmm. and it it worked for us. The battle for America: the story of an extraordinary election. This book reads like a novel. Trust me. And when we come back, we'll take a look at that novelistic aspect and also one of the great subplots involving Ted Kennedy. It's the Battle for America 2008, the story of an extraordinary election, an incredible book about that election, written by Dan Bowles and Haynes Johnson. It's a book published by Viking, and most importantly, it's a James H. Silberman book, about which a fellow by the, jo- the name of George Stephanopoulos and you know, when he first became press secretary, I thought we'd never get around that, that word. But well, we do better now, <laughs> probably not perfectly. Magisterial, George says, captures the thrill of the campaign and its meaning. Balls and Johnson are the true heirs to Teddy White. They manage to see the campaign both from the middle, from the inside out and the outside in to recount the remarkable conversation that took place between the candidates and the country. That's a fascinating phrase that took place between the candidates and the country. And that's a point that you guys make. Yeah, we tried very hard to do this book, not just from the campaign trail, which we did, of course, and, yep. uh, every day, and, and all the voters. and the, But we wanted to get out of the country. And what are the voters thinking and feeling? And there's a disconnect between the two often. Can you understand what's happening, how they feel, how they're reacting as they go forward? And you want to be able to tell all of that story together because that's part of the bigger story of the election, why it was important, what the stakes were for the country. Yeah, story is very important here. At the, at the end of the book, in one of your last interviews with the now president, he, he says it's kind of like a novel. <laughs> it's got tragic characters parading across the stage, and he even <laughs> mentions that plumber boy. Well, we asked in that interview in December, he said, you're a storyteller. How would you tell the story of your election? And he paused and hemmed and hawed for 30 seconds. And then he said, well, I think the whole story is a novel. And then he said, and I'm not even the most interesting character <laughs> yeah, in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he went through Sarah Palin and John McCain and Hillary Clinton. And as you say, Joe the Plumber. Joe the Plumber. And William Ayers and Reverend Wright. And, uh, it, 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 you know, Jim, it was a remarkable cast of characters. I mean, this, yeah. this campaign had so many different elements that came together to make it a good story. Countries at a historic pivot point, potentially a wide open race, deeply unhappy country and divided over the war in Iraq, uh, an economy that's on the edge. We didn't realize how bad it was when the yeah, campaign started, yeah. but there was a sense of economic insecurity out there. And then you get this unbelievable drama with this cast of characters playing out over the better part of two years. It was extraordinary. And the fascinating part about it is that, you know, characters major minor. Uh, a real or, or or phony were all you know presented with a great deal of if not seriousness <laughs> a lot a lot of attention but that gets back to another aspect of, the, of this campaign and that is the media and 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 what role did the media play in this well thing? it's always enormous and in case, this case even more so the age of the internet the age of blogging around the clock journalism 24 hours uh, not much time to step back and for the regular reporting process to go forward to analyze and portray in depth. Uh, We doing a book had more leisure to be able to step back. We hoped to be able to do that, but the media feeds into this frenzy of every day is something dramatic, even though it may not be, and it may miss the story of what was really taking place behind the scenes. Mm. So there's an awful lot to pay attention to an awful lot. Now, even when you're, when you're paying attention to the main story, how are the candidates doing? There's something, there's one fantastically major story going on in the background, and that's the Ted Kennedy thing. The, t- the story that's told in this book about the competition 
between Barack Obama and Hillary and Bill Clinton in particular mm-hmm. for the endorsement of Ted Kennedy is one of the great sub stories of this grander story. Um, they both badly wanted Ted Kennedy's endorsement and he was drawn to Obama though it wasn't clear he was going to endorse him, and he held back for some time. But what he saw in Obama was something that reminded him of his own brothers, Jack and Bobby. And he saw the appeal that Obama had among younger people, including some of his nieces and nephews uh, and their kids. And he was struck that Obama had the capacity, in his estimation, to move the country to a different place politically, Mm. uh, to, to, to transcend some of the old divisions. But the Clintons really wanted his endorsement, and there began a series of conversations on the telephone between Bill Clinton and Ted Kennedy, which we recount in considerable detail in the book. And they are heated conversations. uh, They are strained conversations. It all gets down to the question of to what extent was Bill Clinton injecting race into the Democratic contest? Particularly in South Carolina. Particularly during South Carolina in that three-week period. And- Ted Kennedy was terribly upset that Bill Clinton was contributing to uh, the injection of race into the campaign. And he he confronted Clinton with that in these conversations. Clinton was furious at that. After all, his entire career politically had been aimed at bringing the races together. That played out over weeks, and ultimately the Mm -hmm. endorsement was one of the pivot points in the campaign. The Battle for America, the story of an extraordinary election. The Battle for America 2008, to be precise. The story of an extraordinary election. It covers everything. And after the break, we'll spend some time with John McCain. This is Conversations on the Coast, the book today. The Battle for America 2008. The story of an extraordinary election. The authors who are with us, Dan Balls and Haynes Johnson. It is published by Viking. And it's a... James H. Silberman book. Now, that's called full credit. Full credit. <laughs> Correct. Okay. And uh, the uh, people at Booklist talked about the book and said engrossing. Even readers who followed the election closely, and that's what we were just talking about, will find revelations and new perspectives in the scripting account of a fascinating election season. Um, John McCain. What I got out of... John McCain, in in terms of your presentation, was that this poor guy was never really comfortable running for president because he had to leave the hero slash maverick persona, which is his whole life, and and take on you know like corporate leader, and and man, it never meshed. Well, that's true. He also is someone that wanted to be president. He had the deep background of military service, heroism, father, grandfather, admirals, has all that patriotism in the background. And he sets out in 2000. He wants to be president. He's running against George W. Bush. And Bush crushes him after he, McCain, had beaten Bush in New Hampshire. Yeah. And then eight years later, McCain is again trying to run. And the guy that crushed him is the fellow that he is now having to adopt his own policies of the war, which he he believed in, he, John McCain, but he was trapped. He couldn't extricate himself from that. It was a really tragic situation to be in, and uh, he never quite came out of that. He did, And it was the wrong place for him, the wrong time, and the party Republicans never really fancied uh, they loved John, yeah. John McCain, so he had difficulties across the board. The amazing thing is that he became the nominee of the party. At all. At yeah. all, yes. Yeah, yeah. There are many interviews, uh, there are several interviews in the book uh, with the president, the now, the now president, and uh, toward the end of the book in a section called Interlude, you have the interview where he talks about the whole campaign uh, being, being a novel, but he also uh, gets into more serious political stuff. Could he you does. share that part with us, Dan? I'd be happy to. Uh, this was a remarkably interesting interview, and I want to read two passages, the first having to do with the scope and role of government in his estimation of what the campaign meant, and it's relevant to what's going on today. The question was, did he think that the election marked the end of the Reagan era, the right. end of conservative right. ascendance? And he said, what, uh, he said what Reagan ushered in was a skepticism toward government solutions to every problem, a suspicion of command and control, top-down social engineering. 
And he said, I don't think that has changed. I think that's a lasting legacy of the Reagan era and the conservative movement starting with Goldwater. But I do think what we're seeing is an end to the knee-jerk reaction toward the New Deal and big government. I think what you saw in this election was people saying, yes, we don't want some big bureaucratic ever-expanding state. On the other hand, we don't want a state that's dysfunctional, that doesn't believe in its mission, that can't carry out some of the basic functions of government and provide services to people uh, and be there when they're hurting. And so he said, I think what you're seeing is a correction to the correction. What we don't yet know is whether my administration and this next generation of leadership is going to be able to hew to a new, more pragmatic approach that is less interested in whether we have big government or small government, but is more interested in whether we have smart, effective government. Jim, I think that's a relevant question that's still on the table. Yes, very much so. The last part of the interview, and this was Haynes' idea to ask about Lincoln, because as you remember, he started his campaign in the shadow of the old state house where Lincoln had given his house divided speech. And the question was, to what extent is Lincoln a role model? And he said, Lincoln's my favorite president and one of my personal heroes. He, then he said, I have to be very careful here that in no way am I drawing equivalence between my candidacy, my life experience, or what I face and what he went through. I just want to put that out there so you don't get a bunch of folks saying I'm comparing myself to Lincoln. He then paused and then he went on. What I admire so deeply about Lincoln, number one, I think he's the quintessential American because he's self-made, the way Alexander Hamilton was self-made, or so many of our great iconic Americans are, that sense that you don't accept limits, that you can shape your own destiny. That obviously has appealed to me given where I came from. That American spirit is one of the things that is most fundamental to me, and I think he embodies that. But the second thing that I admire most in Lincoln is that there is just a deep-rooted honesty and empathy to the man that allowed him to always be able to see the other person's point of view and always sought to find that truth that is in the gap between you and me, that the truth is out there somewhere, and I don't fully possess it. And he said that other presidents tried to bend people to their will. He prefers the Lincoln model. Yeah. He also prefers a legislative model that's I would say, still on the drawing boards where people can get beyond partisanship and beyond bipartisanship and all like that to to some kind of coming together in the interest of, of the country, not in their own interest, not in any special interest. This is an extraordinary book, gentlemen, The Battle for America 2008, the story of an extraordinary election by two wonderful journalists, Dan Bowles, Haynes Johnson. Get it, read it, enjoy it, and learn. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster.